Good evening, friends. <clears throat> it's really an honor to be here, and I would like to thank all of those uh, responsible uh, for putting this uh, together, and, and of course, the, uh, the late Stephen Carey, whom this um, lectureship honors, a man I never knew personally, but uh, I, uh, I, I, his, I was always greatly inspired by his um, uh, career of, of service, um, activism and, and Quaker witness and and, um, and and it influenced me greatly uh, and I am um, <clears throat> I'd like to start off uh, with uh, one of my uh, favorite quotes it comes from the um, um, uh, faith and practice of uh, New England uh, yearly meeting of friends a book of discipline <clears throat> friends are called as followers of Christ to help establish the kingdom of God on earth let us strengthen a sense of kinship with everyone. Let that kinship inspire us in our efforts to build a social order free of violence and oppression, in which no person's development is thwarted by poverty and the lack of health care, education, or freedom. Friends are advised to minister to those in need, but also seek to know the facts and the causes of social and economic ills and to work for the removal of those ills. Uh, this has inspired me in, in many of the uh, causes, the concerns in my, my life as, a, as an activist and a, as a scholar, uh, but I, I often have to refer back to this when I think about uh, dealing with uh, is the question of Israel and Palestine, which um, uh, as you all know, it, it can be a particularly challenging um, issue. Uh, it was a little less than a year ago uh, here at Pendle Hill when Steve Chase, who then served uh, as Director of Education, approached me about the possibility of being this year's Stephen Carey Lecturer. I was here uh, as part of a weekend organized by the Quaker Palestine Israel Network and the American French Service Committee to discuss strategies and tactics in support of peace and justice for Israelis and Palestinians. It brought me back to 1981 as one of my first jobs after graduating from college, where I, I, I worked at the Friends Peace Committee of Philadelphia Yearly Meeting, uh, focusing on Israeli-Palestinian issues. I was let go after just a couple of months. The, the major reason was that I, uh, I wasn't seen to have fully accepted the then dominant approach that friends organizations took to the conflict, which was focusing on dialogue between Jews and, and Arabs, uh, a, an approach um, based on the idea that, that peace and reconciliation required hearing each other's stories uh, and, and perspectives. Now, I, I certainly could not disagree uh, 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 with the goal of reconciliation between these two historically oppressed uh, peoples. And I certainly uh, recognize the, the need for dialogue and, and mutual uh, uh, understanding. Um, but you know, part of this approach uh, that uh, Friends Peace Committee and others advocated was, 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 was not to do anything that might upset uh, those in the uh, leadership of the Jewish community in Philadelphia. And it was rather hard, I found it difficult to do that and work on Israel and Palestine at the same time. Um, and, and, and indeed, the, the, for, for me, um, and, and this is no contradiction, of course, to the idea of reconciliation, but I, I thought it important that friends recognize and, and name, if you will, the great asymmetry in power at this point in history between Israelis and, and Palestinians. One group was living under a foreign belligerent occupation, and the other was the occupier. And our government was largely responsible <laughs> for uh, this uh, happening. Uh, I, for example, I, I, I wondered why I had been I, 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 I wonder why I had been asked to uh, circulate a petition as, as part of some of my other projects with with the Peace Committee, uh, a petition on the South uh, calling on the South Korean government. Uh, which was then under a right-wing uh, military junta, uh, to better respect uh, uh, human rights without a concomitant demand 
on North Korea, but I was forbidden from circulating a petition by clergy calling for the Israeli government to better respect the rights of Palestinians because it did not also include a, uh, a call for better uh, he, uh, respect for human rights by Arab states. Um, there, you know, the the the, the, the um, petition on South Korea was kind of was a given, but the the, the petition I uh, I, uh, I proposed circulating was considered unbalanced. Uh, I, I also wondered why Quaker organizations had clear policies in opposition to military aid to El Salvador, for example. This is the 1980s, um, and other governments which used U.S. weapons systems and ordnance to kill civilians, but no such uh, positions regarding the much larger amount of U.S. aid uh, to Israel. Indeed, at, at, Friends, uh, at Friends Center and on various uh, regional committees on which I served subsequently, I developed a reputation in Quaker circles for being one of the more strident pro-Palestinian voices. Well, since moving to California a little over 20 years ago, I. I had become less involved with friends organizations working on Israel and Palestine. So imagine my surprise when I came here for the QPEN AFSC gathering here last year and found myself as one of the more moderate voices in the room. <laughs> my perspective on the conflict had not fundamentally changed. <laughs> Yet there is a discernible shift in the dominant discourse among friends active on this issue. Uh, while I carried some somewhat ambivalent feelings about the uh, campaign for boycotts, divestment, and sanctions uh, against Israel, much of the weekend was centered on promoting BDS. And, and while I, I still support a two-state solution, many people seem to perceive Israel as an illegitimate ethno-nationalist state and that the expansion of settlements and other demographic and political factors had made a two-state solution uh, no longer possible. Now, this shift is quite understandable. In, in many respects, given the dramatic shift to the right in the, in the Israeli policies and the um, decision by the U.S. government to continue to support the Israeli government regardless. But it has had its consequences in placing uh, the AFSC and other Quaker organizations under extreme pressure. In one sense, this isn't new. Um, as far back as the early 70s, uh, the AFSC book at Search for Peace in the Middle East which was extraordinarily moderate and understated by today's standards, was subjected to vicious attack and misrepresentation. So on one sense, we're going to get this kind of flack regardless. Uh, how, how, now, however, uh, even Quaker institutions are distancing themselves from AFSC. Uh, for example, for years, lower school students at um, Friends Central School put on a concert to raise money for the AFSC. It was a tiny amount of money. It was raised by the pupils themselves. I think last year they had the grand total of $28. However, the Friends Central Administration decided that due to AFSC support for BDS, the money would go to a non-Quaker charity instead. Now, let's recall that AFSC supports the use of boycotts and divestment campaigns targeting only companies that support the occupation, settlements, and militarization and other violations of international humanitarian uh, or human rights law. They do not call for a full boycott of Israel, nor of, of companies because they are either Israelis or doing business in Israel, nor do the actions focus on individuals. Uh, also, let's remember that barely 1% of AFSC's total budget is directed towards Israeli-Palestinian peace education work, and only a minority of that goes to supporting boycotts and divestment. In other words, the French Central Administration <laughs> decided to not allow their students to support AFSC because of barely three-tenths of one percent of uh, the AFSC's budget. Now, now, if my wife and I looked at the scores of charitable and other nonprofit groups uh, we uh, give to annually, I would guess that we'd have a hard time finding many of them with which we agree with over 99.7% of their spending priorities. And I imagine most of you <laughs> it would, would be the same. However, because of three-tenths of 1% of AFSC's budget advocated the use of boycotts and divestment in opposition to the oppression of Palestinian Arabs, the leadership of Friends Central uh, came to the conclusion uh, that they could not allow the students to donate uh, money to this venerable Quaker organization. Um, indeed, 
given the relatively small sum of money donated by the students, um, the, the amount that would go to support um, uh, B, uh, 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 the BDS would come out to, I think, about 12 cents. Um, uh, and, but despite this, uh, and you can look at their website, uh, the, the, the uh, Friends Central Board went to great lengths to emphasize that Friends Central was a freestanding friend school, not under the care of a Quaker meeting or any other friends organization, and would ensure that they would not uh, direct funds, that is, that 12 cents, uh, to BDS work. <laughs> Now, I, I remember um, one of my first volunteer efforts with AFSC uh, at, at age 19 um, was in support of boycotts, uh, uh, divestment, and sanctions in relation to the occupation of Namibia by apartheid South Africa. Um, in the early 90s, I worked with AFSC in opposition to the Indonesian occupation of East Timor and the Moroccan occupation of Western Sahara. Indeed, boycotts have been used by Quakers for centuries, uh, such as the refusal to buy products produced by slaves. Um, more recent examples have included boycotts of non-union lettuce and grapes uh, uh, in support of California migrant farm workers, and to boycott certain brands of coffee connected to uh, 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 um, Salvadoran death squads. What is it about boycotts involving Israel that has led to such a reaction, and why would a friend school seek to distance itself from the AFSC over 12 cents? Um, as with the different approaches taken towards South Korea and Israel when I was at the Peace Committee, there are concerns about the strong feelings of some Jews who have a particular attachment towards Israel, uh, the world's only Jewish state, and a perceived need to be sensitive about that. Unfortunately, sensitivity to the concerns of one oppressed group can come across as insensitivity to another. Uh, for example, giving special attention to the process involving a Palestinian speaker due to the concern of some Jewish members of the community can come across as insensitivity to Palestinians or even anti-Arab racism. Uh, to use another case from Friends Central, uh, um, many of you are familiar with the school's uh, recent uh, controversial decision to postpone a scheduled talk by Swarthmore Peace Studies Professor Saad Achan, a, a well-respected Palestinian Quaker pacifist, member of the Pendle Hill Board, and beloved member of Central Philadelphia Meeting. Uh, when some of us heard the news, uh, we looked at it along the lines of, of this. Um, Friends Central has had white Quakers speak there without such postponement, but they did put a pause on having an Arab Quaker. Friends Central has had white pacifists uh, speak there without a postponement, but they did not put on a pause for having an Arab pacifist. Uh, Friends Central has had white professors speak there without such, such a postponement, but uh, they did put a pause in having an Arab professor. Friends Central has had white people speak, about, speak at, F at FCS about nonviolence, human rights, peace building, and conflict re re regions, but um, they did. They did put a pause in having Arabs speak about nonviolence, human rights, and peace building in a conflict region. Um, and the, the defenders of the move insist it's not about um, uh, Professor Shan being Arab, but about his support for BDS. However, had the proposed speaker not been a Quaker Palestinian who Quaker Palestinian who supported boycotts, divestment sanctions, and other nonviolent means of challenging the Israeli occupation, but instead been a white Quaker Crimean who supported boycotts, divestment sanctions, and other nonviolent means against the Russian occupation, would they have had objections to him speaking? Indeed, if, if one views this in this manner, one could say it was, it was, it was based on racism because Professor Atshan was a Palestinian Arab and they invoked a special policy. I do not believe that was their intent, however. I really don't. I, I, I believe that in, in recognition that there was particular concern among some in the community about some positions taken by Professor Atshan that um, even though his positions, in my view, are not at all unreasonable, uh, they believe it was important to be some kind of special process uh, to go through before allowing him to speak at the school. And so my guess is that, you know, if there, if there, if, if there were a number of Russian Orthodox parents <laughs> at Friends Central who supported the Russian government in a manner uh, similar to some Jewish parents who supported the Israeli government, then I believe Friends Central indeed would have responded in a similar manner. Now, 
as, as, as there's a tendency in Quaker organizations uh, when faced with controversy, um, the folks at Friends Central blamed a breakdown in process and formed a committee. Um, uh, this committee is co-headed by a Quaker, a Jew, and a Muslim. I understand that it took most of the first meeting even to agree on a name. Um, they decided to, to not even use the name Palestinian in the group, instead referring to the Israeli-Arab conflict, uh, the preferred term of those who tend to portray the conflict of that as a besieged Israel surrounded by hostile states and minimize the national aspirations of a distinct Palestinian people. Um, we'll, we'll see where this leads. Um, but um, and clearly, as head of school Craig Sellers and others fully acknowledge, the controversy should have been handled better. But it raises some interesting questions. On the one hand, I remember as a young man how the AFSC, various Quaker schools, and other institutions brought in people from conflict regions to tell their stories and perspectives, uh, perspectives which, uh, due to biases in Washington, D.C., the mainstream media, and elsewhere, we did not normally get to hear. Some of these people you know, from Vietnam, Namibia, Nicaragua, South Africa, El Salvador, and elsewhere took positions at times which made some friends uncomfortable and contradicted our understanding of the peace testimony and other forms of witness. Yet there were perspectives that were important to hear as Americans, even if we believed that they were wrong in some respects. To use a domestic analogy, as a white male being exposed to ideas put forward by black nationalists or, or radical feminists made me uncomfortable. And if, even upon f further reflection, I might not agree with all they say, it was still important to hear someone speaking their truth because it was something, because of my privilege, I would not otherwise hear. It, it brought me greater understanding and, and moved me forward in some important ways, even if I did not buy the whole package. Um, and, it, and, and in exposing people to, the, to witnesses from the global south over the years, Friends School and organizations did not insist on balancing the perspective of black South African anti-apartheid activists with a white South African pro-apartheid speaker, uh, or human rights activists from El Salvador with a supporter of the Salvadoran junta, or an East Timorese speaker with a supporter of the Indonesian occupation. Why do some Friends institutions believe their only has to be balance if the speaker is a Palestinian or a supporter of Palestinian rights. Now, some would argue that it, because it, the situation is indeed different. Not that Israeli policies are any more justifiable than those by other repressive right-wing governments, but that Israel is the world's only Jewish state. Um, let, let's reflect on that for a moment. Um, there's only one black state in the world. Even if, even if it had invaded and occupied its neighbors and was engaging in repression and colonization in the lands they had seized by force, there would be a lot of African Americans, along with white liberals, who might be somewhat defensive about criticisms, even if justifiable. Indeed, as critical as I am of Israeli policies, if I walk into a room and I overhear a couple people I don't know going on and on and on about all the terrible things that Israeli, Israel is doing to Palestinians, I get nervous even if I agree with everything they're saying. Because I have to wonder, why are they saying these things really? Is it because they're concerned about peace and human rights and justice everywhere? Or because they're looking for excuses to criticize the world's only Jewish state? In that sense, discourse on Palestine and Israel is different. We do sometimes need to bend over backwards to reassure our Jewish friends, neighbors, colleagues, and others that we are not unfairly singling out Israel, and that our concerns about Israel and Palestine are consistent with our witness regarding violence and justice everywhere. We do need to exercise a special sensitivity. The question, however, is to what extent are Quakers and Quaker institutions required to show special sensitivity to right-wing militaristic positions by pro-Israeli national chauvinists. The fact is, is that as a result of the internalized oppression and other reasons, there are some Jews, like those of other faith traditions or, or no faith tradition, 
who are more or less set in their ways and all the listening and rewording and rescheduling is not going to change them. We should not hold back out of fear of getting people upset at us. I know that's difficult for some friends, particularly those of us of white, middle-class, Anglo-Saxon backgrounds. <laughs> we don't like being falsely accused of prejudice of any kind. We don't like being falsely accused in the media. We don't like losing donors to our financially struggling institutions. We don't like being yelled at. And this can lead to some short-sighted decisions. Um, Friends Central is not the only friend school which has prevented students from hearing the perspectives of Middle East uh, peacemakers, uh, nor does this restriction apply just to Palestinians. Just a couple years ago, Friends Academy on Long Island canceled a scheduled assembly, which was to be followed by a lunchtime dialogue with students, by two young Israeli conscientious objectors. Neither the head of school at the time of the cancellation nor the current head of school, nor the chair of the board has been willing to explain, despite my repeated inquiries, why they canceled the presentations. I talked with one Jewish parent, a former Israeli, uh, whose daughter was valedictorian this past year, and she suspects that anti-Semitism may have played a role, uh, since non-Jewish conscience objectors uh, have been allowed to speak both before and after that incident. Uh, the Israelis were to talk about their leadings, which led them to refuse military service. Uh, which would have included raising concerns about brutal, the brutal Israeli occupation. As a result, uh, others suspect that rather than anti-Semitism, the Friends Academy uh, motivation uh, was, was, was motivated by a kind of anti-Arab racism, that, that believing that Palestinians have no right <laughs> to um, freedom, that they should be forced to live under foreign military occupation, and that their students should therefore not be exposed to those who believe otherwise. Um, now, some people have tried to explain the decision by the leadership at Friends Central and Friends Academy that the leadership of these schools are somehow not responsible for their decision, but they were pressured by Jewish parents for whom they rely on financial contributions. Um, I, I've seen no evidence to support this claim, however, and, and the head of school at Friends Central has explicitly denied any such pressure. Indeed, such assumptions parallel the ugly stereotype of blaming some kind of cabal of wealthy Jews behind the scenes, effectively scapegoating Jews to the decision of some non-Jewish administrators and board members. And, and we must not fall into anti-Semitism as an ex excuse for anti-Arab racism. Indeed, I think we need to be conscious of how anti-Semitism, like other forms of oppression, can operate on an unaware level. Instead of pushing ourselves to be less shy and reticent, there's a tendency to see some Jews as pushy. Instead of being more responsible for our finances and those of our organizations, there's a pull to see some, see some Jews as money-grubbing. Instead of effectively prioritizing our campaign contributions and efforts to influence legislation on Capitol Hill, we come to view the pro-Israel lobby as all-powerful. Instead of demanding that our friend schools give Middle Eastern peacemakers the same kind of access as other peacemakers, there's a pull to blame wealthy Jewish parents. So even if there is some excuse, I'm sorry, sorry even if there is some truth to claims of threats of withdrawal of a financial contribution, let's remember that Quaker schools and other institutions have received pressure from parents and others because of our principled commitments to desegregation, peace in Vietnam and Central America, majority rule in South Africa, ending the arms race, climate justice, labor rights, and more. Yet their administrations and boards have almost always stood up to principle. Let's remember that tomorrow is the 50th anniversary of Martin Luther King's speech at Riverside Church in which he denounced the Vietnam War in very strong terms, along with U.S. militarism and imperialism in general. Despite knowing that he would alienate the Johnson administration, which had pushed through civil rights legislation, that he would alienate much of the liberal media, which had supported him, and that he would alienate many progressive donors who would provide important financial support for his efforts. Despite that, he argued that, quote, a time comes when silence is betrayal. He noted how, quote, 
The human spirit does not move without great difficulty against all the apathy of conformist thought within one's own bosom and in the surrounding world. Moreover, when the issues at hand seem as perplexing as they often do in the case of this dreadful conflict, we are always on the verge of being mesmerized by uncertainty. But we must move on. Some of us who have already begun to break the silence of the night have found that the calling to speak is often a vocation of agony, but we must speak. We must speak with all the humility that is appropriate to our limited vision, but we must speak. Yes, while we do need special care on how to speak out regarding Israel and Palestine, we still need to speak out. Perhaps the biggest challenge is not as much anti-Arab racism or anti-Semitism, but the fail failure to stay true to our convictions. Indeed, many Quakers, despite deep concern about Israeli policies, are often afraid to talk to their Jewish friends about it, even, even as they've been fine about freely discussing other controversial political issues. I, I, I know many friends who are very knowledgeable and engaged on many political issues, including, you know, various conflicts around the world, but when it comes to Israel and Palestine, their eyes glaze over. Um, and there's also concern about inadvertently encouraging anti-Semitism. On the one hand, of course, charges of anti-Semitism against the AFSC and other advocates for Palestinian rights are, are, are usually no more than McCarthyistic attacks designed to stifle any challenges to Israeli policies and, and should not be taken seriously. On the other hand, the fact is that anti-Semitism really does exist not just in terms of the frightening rise of threats and vandalism by neo-Nazis, but in more subtle manifestations. Like racism and sexism, it is ubiquitous. Despite, and despite our best efforts to the contrary, we all carry some of it as a reflection of growing up in an oppressive society. Many friends have long supported the existence of Israel, despite reservations regarding any kind of ethno-religious state, as a kind of a form of global affirmative action for an oppressed people who for centuries never found security as a minority. There is therefore particular concern about seeming to unfairly single out Israel, particularly in the light of all these other oppressive governments in the world. To give um, but one analogy, like many friends, I have some moral reservations about abortion. However, I generally keep quiet about it because I am male. <laughs> Because I believe it is vitally important that it remain a safe and legal option for women. I don't want to inadvertently encourage the right-wing misogynists who dominate the anti-abortion uh, narrative. Many Quakers feel the same way about Israel. Um, they're also concerned about, about tactics. Uh, the original BDS call by Palestinian civil society organizations includes demands that they not just end the occupation, but to allow for the right of return of all Palestinian refugees and their descendants, which if carried out would mean Jews would become a minority and Israel would no longer be a, a Jewish majority state. This is where uh, the, the, the line that BDS wants to destroy Israel <laughs> comes from, even though um, the endorsement by FSC and other groups of boycotts and, and divestment as a tactic doesn't imply the wholesale endorsement of any formal BDS call. In any case, Given the role of anti-Jewish boycotts historically, such as those immediately preceding the Holocaust in Germany, boycotting the world's only Jewish state you know, seems uh, inappropriate uh, to many people. My own view, however, is that if friends and others concerned with Israel and Palestine don't take leadership for the right reasons, the movement will become dominated by those, by those who do so for the wrong reasons. Um, the AFSC and other Quaker organizations involved in peace, human rights, and social justice work have often been in coalitions with groups we did not agree with on some important issues and have even endorsed demonstrations and other events with which we did not support every single plank. As Renice Johnson Regan pointed out, if you are comfortable with everyone in your coalition, you're not in a coalition. <laughs> at, at the same time, <laughs> At the same time, both to preserve our credibility and as a matter of principle, I do believe there needs to be a particularly strong process of discernment in terms of who we work with on this particular issue. 
As we have seen when trends have become active in political movements uh, regarding issues in the global south, such as Vietnam, Central America, South Africa, and, and other conflicts, there are some who become aware of the suffering uh, of people, particularly when the United States has played an important role, uh, and have been so distressed by it, uh, and it's so easy to become appalled, upset, angry, that, that many have ended up taking positions and embraced tactics in the midst of such solidarity work that is essentially indistinguishable from secular far-left elements. Uh, we also have a long tradition supporting the underdog, which sometimes makes it difficult to fully appreciate the complexities of a given conflict. It is important we, do, we not, do not do that, however, especially in a situation like Israel and Palestine, even though the frustrations can feel overwhelming at some times. Um, uh, one illustration, I think, was a reaction to the Friends Central decision to postpone Professor Ashan's talk and the suspension of the two teachers who in invited him, uh, both of whom were young queer women of color. Many of us were very upset, uh, especially as supporters of the decision attacked him uh, uh, in the Philadelphia Inquirer, falsely accusing him of being a jihadist, of being anti-Semitic and other things, you know, severely damaging the reputation of this not yet tenured professor. You know, based on the hundreds of emails the school received, there seemed to be a reaction almost along the lines of, well, if supporters of the occupation could get upset, apply pressure, and be nasty, we need to counter it by being the same way. Um, in one sense, I suppose it's good, a good thing to serve notice that finally, regarding pressure regarding Israeli-Palestinian issues can come from more than one direction. At the same time, though, I would argue that this approach is, is, is unquakerly. Um, now, I, I would like to offer some thoughts on some specific issues uh, before I conclude about how friends might be able to more effectively address the issue of Israel-Palestine, one which takes into account the sensitivity and unique aspects of the issue while at the same time not hesitating to speak truth to power. First of all, uh, regarding BDS. Now, most of us who focus on Israel and Palestine more than other issues uh, do, do not do so because Israel is Jewish. <laughs> Though there are certainly other governments which, with even worse human rights records, the vast majority of the, the suppression takes place within these countries' internationally recognized borders. Now, the repression is repression regardless. The international community does have a particular obligation to defend the rights of those under foreign belligerent occupation, including uh, the right to national self-determination. And multinational corporations have a moral and legal responsibility regarding their investments in non-self-governing territories. Um, today, there are only two countries that are engaged in what the United Nations the international community recognizes as a foreign belligerent occupation of entire nations, Israel and Morocco. Um, I should mention though, a moral case could be made for independence by some other uh, uh, nations, uh, such as Tibet, Chechnya, West Papua. The international community deems them as being within the internationally recognized uh, borders of other countries. As of the West Bank, a number of companies support Morocco's ongoing illegal occupation of Western Sahara. And as in the case of uh, Israeli-occupied territories, U.S. arms manufacturers have provided Morocco, uh, Moroccan occupation forces uh, uh, with weapons, uh, you know, the, the, uh, occupation forces which have engaged in what independent human rights groups have described as gross and systematic human rights violations. Um, uh, the, uh, I, I believe that the AFSC and other Quaker organizations um, and those in the Palestinian uh, solidarity struggle overall will be considerably strengthened and, uh, and that uh, if instead of calling for divestment specifically from companies supporting the Israeli occupation, the call was from divestment from companies supporting all f recognized foreign bell uh, belligerent occupations of nations. So, like, like, and again, this is like, uh, again, this would only include, legally speaking, uh, the addition of Western Sahara. Like Palestine, Western Saharan civil society supports such efforts. It would effectively you know, mean just one additional country and only a small number of companies. It would not take much attention away from the Israeli occupation and Western companies supporting that occupation. And more importantly, it would help move the debate away from a divisive pro-Israel versus anti-Israel dichotomy 
where people usually end up talking past each other, <laughs> to where the debate belongs, human rights and international law. Morocco is a predominantly Muslim Arab country. By including Western Sahara along with Palestine, the movement would avoid the accusation that is unfairly singling out Israel. After all, it would be targeting all illegal occupations, not just one. And you know, Morocco, like Israel, is in violation of uh, Syria's UN Security Council resolutions and a landmark ruling of the International Court of Justice. Uh, Morocco, like Israel, has illegally moved tens of thousands of settlers into occupied territory. Morocco, like Israel, has illegally built a separation wall through the occupied territories. Morocco, like Israel, relies on the United States and other Western support to maintain the occupation by rendering the UN powerless to enforce international law. Morocco, like Israel, is able to maintain the occupation in part through the support of multinational corporations. And just as Palestine is recognized by scores of countries and is a full member of the Arab League, Western Sahara is recognized by scores of countries and is a full member of the African Union thereby ensuring international support. Not only would including uh, all occupations in the divestment campaign help protect the movement from spurious charges of anti-Semitism and broaden its appeal, it would help bring attention to the little-known but important self-determined uh, nation struggle by the Sahrawi people against the illegal and oppressive Moroccan occupation of their country, which uh, was invaded by the U.S.-backed kingdom in 1975, just eight years after the Israeli conquest of the West Bank and other Arab territories. Given the intense polarization, harsh polemics, and suspicions regarding Israel and Palestine, a campaign based more on a universal legal and moral principles against occupation, rather than targeting a particular country that has a strong and influential domestic constituency, I believe would be far more effective. Given the suffering of the Palestinian and Sahrawi peoples and the complicity of the U.S. government and U.S. corporations in their oppression, they deserve nothing less. The second suggestion I have is in regard to the role of the United States. In his famous address at Riverside Church, Dr. King noted how the United States government is regretfully the greatest purveyor of violence in the world today. That is unfortunately as accurate a description now as it was in 1967. Again, there, though, although there is nothing wrong with placing particular emphasis on Israel-Palestine, if that is how one is led, we must understand it and challenge it within the context of U.S. militarism and imperialism. Because the fact is, there is no way that Israel would be able to maintain its occupation, repression, and colonization of the occupied territories, nor could it get away with the kinds of war crimes that it has committed uh, in its periodic military operations and in the uh, Gaza Strip, uh, Lebanon, and elsewhere, were it not for the unconditional military, financial, and diplomatic support of the United States. As citizens of the United States, American Quakers have far more power to influence our own government than foreign governments. Back in the 1980s, during the slaughter in El Salvador, we generally did not protest before the Salvadoran embassy. We protested at U.S. government buildings because we recognized that as horrible as the Salvadoran regime may have been, they were only able to engage in the massacres and repression as a direct result of U.S. support. Without the U.S. veto in the United Nations, Israel would be subjected to international sanctions and other pressure that would have long ago forced them to end the occupation and colonization and allow for Palestinian independence. Israel engages in the repressive politics and violations of its international legal responsibilities because it can. Any other country in a hostile region, given such a blank check by the world's one remaining superpower, would probably do the same kinds of things. Indeed, Morocco has done what it has done because the United States, along with France, has also blocked the United Nations Security Council from enforcing its resolutions and calling for an end of the occupation and allowing for self-determination for Western Sahara. The United States supports Israel, I believe, not out of concern for its security. Indeed, the stronger Israel has become militarily, the stronger the U.S. support. Nor is it the Jewish vote, as Jews have become a decreasing percentage of the U.S. population and increasingly divided on the question of Israel, U.S. backing of the Israeli government has grown. As with U.S. foreign policy uh, in general, uh, 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 <clears throat> in general, uh, the real motivation, I believe, is perceived strategic interests. Uh, in a region where radical nationalism and Islamist extremism could threaten U.S. control of oil and other strategic 
uh, interest. Israel has played a major role in preventing victories by radical uh, nationalist and Islamist movements, not just in Palestine, but in Lebanon and Jordan as well. Israel has kept Syria, Iran, and other countries that Washington opposes in check. The Israeli Air Force is predominant in the region. Israel's frequent wars have provided battlefield testing for U.S. weapons, and, and Israel's arms industry has provided uh, weapons and munitions for governments and opposition movements supported by the United States. Wherever, uh, uh, during the, the um, uh, 1980s, uh, Israel served as a conduit for U.S. arms to governments and movements too unpopular in the United States to receive overt military assistance, including South Africa under the apartheid regime, Iran's Islamic Republic, Guatemala's rightist military junta, and the Nicaraguan Contras. More recently, they've supplied, supplied arms to Colombian paramilitaries and others. Israeli military advisors assisted the Contras and, and, and Salvadorans and others. The uh, intelligence agency, the Israeli intelligence agency Mossad, has cooperated with the CIA and, and other U.S. agencies in gathering intelligence and spearheading covert operations. Israel possesses missiles capable of uh, as hitting uh, as far as the former, um, uh, as, as far as far as Russia. Um, the, um, uh, the, the Israel has collaborated with the U.S. military industrial complex in research and development of new jet fighters, anti-missile defense systems, a relationship that is growing every year. Israel has trained U.S. forces bound for Af Iraq and Afghanistan in counterterrorism and in, in, in counterinsurgency tactics. As one Israeli analyst uh, described it, it's like Israel has become another federal agency, one that's convenient to use when you want something done quietly. A former, a former U.S. Secretary of State once described Israel as the largest and only unsinkable U.S. aircraft carrier in the world. Uh, and, you know, one of the fundamental uh, principles of international relations theory is, is the most stable uh, relationship between two countries, um, besides disarmament, is strategic parity. Um, and because you know, it, it, it allows for an effective deterrent against the other side, but but the United States and, and, and but but you know but, but um, if the United States was concerned simply with Israel's security, um, we would uh, maintain Israeli defenses at a level equal to uh, approximately equal to any combination of Arab uh, uh, armed forces. But instead, U.S. leaders of both political parties have insisted that uh, that we ensure qualitative uh, mil Israeli military superiority. There's less consensus about backing uh, uh, Israel uh, when it was not so, so, so dominant. Again, it's less about concern for Israel's survival, that's maintaining uh, an, an ally, a dependent ally's military predominance in, in the region. Uh, I followed the, 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 the history of arms shipments to Israel, and the, more, the stronger, more aggressive, and more compliant Israel has come to U.S. interest, the higher the level of aid and strategic uh, cooperation. A militant Israel is seen to advance American strategic interests. Indeed, in Israel in a constant state of war, technologically sophisticated and military advanced, yet lacking an independent economy and dependent on the United States, is far more willing to perform tasks unacceptable to other allies uh, than, a, than, say, in Israel at peace with its neighbors. Uh, uh, Henry Kissinger once put it, in reference to Israel's reluctance to make peace, Israel's obstinacy serves the purposes of both our countries best. Indeed, I've documented quite a few cases where, where the United States has, has taken positions which have helped make Israeli-Palestinian peace impossible, even taking positions to the right of uh, the Israeli government and Israeli public opinion. So you know, the fact is that the refusal of the United States to apply pressure to end uh, on Israel to end its colonization of the West Bank and, and, and its occupation is not just bad for Palestinians, but it's bad for Israelis. It has essentially made a viable two-state solution and therefore a sustainable peace settlement virtually impossible. Illegal Israeli settlements and roads reserved for Jews only create an apartheid-type situation and make it extremely difficult um, for Israeli forces to defend against a population angry at the occupiers who have confiscated what is often their best land. Israel will be far more secure defending a clearly defined and internationally recognized border than an archipelago of the illegal outposts within Palestinian territory. Many of those in Washington who call themselves supporters of Israel are supporting Israel's hawks who are making the country more dependent upon the United States and more vulnerable in the long term. 
and increases Israel's vulnerability by preventing it from recognizing its natural alliance with the world's Afro-Asian majority. Within Israel, there has been a, a progressive minority that supports the necessary compromises for peace, but, and, uh, and, and as well as a, a, a large number that uh, does not. But the, 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 those, most Israelis are in the middle, but as Israeli uh, scholar and, and peace activist Galia Golan describes it, quote, they will lean left when Israel is feeling pressure from the United States, but lean right in situations like today where there is no U.S. pressure. And for reasons I've outlined, I don't think we particularly want to give pressure. The combination of Israeli technology, Palestinian entrepreneurship, and industrialness and Arabian oil wealth could result in an economic, political, and social transformation of the Middle East. This would be highly beneficial for the region's inhabitants, but not necessarily to powerful U.S. interests which benefit from the current policy of divide and rule. And Israel at peace with its neighbors would be far less likely to be willing to serve as a reliable ally in support of U.S. hegemonic designs in this critical region. As a result, and, and, and one thing that bothers me about this in particular is how it parallels historic anti-Semitism. I mean, think about it. When the, the ruler, the, the, there'd be a, 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 a um, a de facto agreement between certain uh, people in the, in the Jewish community and, and the ruling class of the given country saying, we will give you a degree of, um, of, of, of cultural and religious autonomy if you're willing to do the dirty work for us, to be the money lenders, to be the tax collectors, to be the visible agents of the oppressive order. I mean, if you would rise up against the oppression, the ruling class could say, oh, no, it's not us, it's the, it's the Jews. And you'd have the pogroms. You know, the, the waves of repression, Jews would scatter to other countries, and the cycle would start again. This went on for centuries, culminating, of course, in the Holocaust. And the whole idea behind Zionism would if Jews could have the, their own nation state, they would no longer be dependent on the whims of the ruling class. But tragically, this pattern is now happening on a global level. Initially, it was written in France when they used Israel to go after Nasser in 1956 and in ways I've described and more since the United States became uh, Israel's primary backer after 1967. Um, so a, a, as a result, it's, it's important to point out that we are not talking about Israel versus Palestine, but the United States versus peace and security for both peoples. That the United States may be anti-Palestinian, but it is not ultimately pro-Israeli. The problem is not Israel per se, but U.S. support for the most right-wing militaristic elements in Israel, which, which the United States has helped bring to power and sustain. Uh, there's a lot more that I could say. I've already talked too long. But, but what this underlies is, is that in order to address Israel and Palestine effectively, one needs nuance, reflection, discernment, empathy, a willingness to listen, and an ability to keep a global perspective while prioritizing the responsibilities we have in our own country. This is not easy. And yet, all these things, all, all of this are things that friends have shown themselves to be particularly good at. As a result, Despite how messy and complicated and problematic our efforts have been on this issue over the years, I do believe that friends have a particularly strong ability to address Israel and Palestine in a fair and effective manner. And that is why I believe we have no choice but to continue to do so. Thank you. very much, Stephen, for some very provocative things to say. I hope that there will be, and I cannot imagine that there will not be some questions or comments from our friends who are here 
to listen to what you've had to say. So would you like to call on them as I wander around? Uh, because if I'm wandering, I don't get to see whose hands are going up and in what order. I'll try, but help me if I end up um, right. Yeah, thank you. There's a, there's a brave person ready to just leap into the fray. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Stephen. Um, your talk really made me think. Um, very interested in your comments about the death squads of El Salvador in the 1980s and how um, protests at the Salvadoran embassy didn't seem to make sense. It made more sense to go to the School of the Americas or, or other US government uh, centers of power. Um, that's my takeaway from your comments about um, the tendency to try to put pressure on Israel as opposed to the United States government. Um, am I understanding you correctly? Is that a good analogy to make? Yeah, yeah I, I, I mean, I, I, I don't think there's anything wrong. Uh, just as we publicized during the 1980s, uh, the, the, the crimes of the Salvadoran government, and uh, it was generally in the context of why are we supporting this kind of thing as opposed to they are bad, <laughs> you know? And, and I, I think often, you know, the, the um, you know, around Israel-Palestine, there's often a tendency to, um, I think because there is such a great idealistic view of um, uh, about, about around around Israel about how, how how wonderful and democratic and progressive and et cetera et cetera, um, you know, there's a pull to say no, they do this, they do this, this, this. yeah. And again, <laughs> my father's there's the, uh, most of his criticisms are unfortunately true, but um, it's also the kind of thing that tends to make people defensive. Um, you know, those who do care about about Israel uh, and you know uh, and I think you know if the, if the emphasis was that uh, uh, U.S. policy is making these bad things possible, and not only is it terrible for the immediate victims, Palestinians, uh, Lebanese, other Arabs, um, that uh, it's ultimately bad for Israel as well. I think that would uh, uh, that would op I think make it easier for people to acknowledge and and recognize uh, the the injustice and and more likely to try to do something about it, try to change U.S. policy. Uh, towards one, you know, more resembling tough love or whatever, and one that, uh, you know, that that uh, is willing to, to live up to our international uh, re responsibilities. Because remember, the World Court and the question of settlements and and the wall, uh, separation wall and a lot of other things, the U.S. has supported explicitly has called on the United States as Israel's primary backer to ensure uh, that um, Israel abide by the Fourth Geneva Convention. Indeed, if you sign the Fourth Geneva Convention, you are obligated not just to violate yourself, but do what's reasonable to make sure other countries don't violate it. So in effect, we are violating the Fourth Geneva Convention by, by, by paying for supporting uh, these Israeli uh, violations of the Fourth Geneva Convention and, and preventing the international community from doing anything about it. Um, so this is a follow-up question, which is that, so the BDS call, um, I have two, two parts to this question. One is that the BDS call, kind of like, um, um, protesting at uh, the embassy is is actually putting pressure on in, in many cases international com companies mm -hmm. yeah. and and that that's the that's the strategy is to is to and actually the whole idea behind it is not necessarily to hurt the com to destroy the companies or anything but to persuade the mm -hmm. companies to change yeah. right mm -hmm. so so, um, and one of the most active campaigns right now is a Hewlett Packard campaign, which mm -hmm. is targeting a U.S. company, mm -hmm. which is um, responsible for making the biometric ID scans that limit Palestinian movement mm -hmm. uh, in in the region. And and there's there was that was taken up by the campaign for Palestinian rights and mm -hmm. the BDS National Committee explicitly because it's a U.S. company, mm -hmm. and because and because campaigns that are in the country targeting are tend to be more effective mm -hmm. so it, it to me it's a very very oh, similar yeah. to what you're saying yeah, I, and, and, and so I'm all for those kind of campaigns and so that's yes. so that's one piece about it so the the theory behind bds is about mm -hmm. um is about putting pre economic pressure globally 
to mm -hmm. to put to then put pressure on Israel to change policy mm -hmm. or the U.S. or obviously the U.S. Yeah. as well. Yeah. So that's one. Com that's just a comment. Mm -hmm. And then the other question is that I have is that the BDS call came from an incredible unification of civil society organizations. The hundreds of them, yes. Right, and that that BDS call and that Palestinian rights. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, people who are working for Palestinian rights are led by those people who called for it. Yeah. And it doesn't seem like um, the, the corollary is true necessarily with Morocco, et cetera. And, mm -hmm. and so like if you, if you as a solidarity activist prioritize, mm -hmm. you know, foregrounding the voices of those people who are impacted most, mm -hmm. most directly by the conflict and, and foregrounding their leadership, how does the how does the your proposal operate? Because because how do we how do we do that in the case of what you're talking about? Well, uh, you know, part of the, part of the, uh, there have been calls uh, by by um, the Western Saharans uh, through their representatives in the Polisario Front, the Sahrawi Arab Democratic Republic, and through uh, women's organizations and others uh, f for just such a uh, you know, BDS equivalent. It's not as well organized. It's not it has not been as well organized in large part because the situation in well, West in Western Sahara is even more oppressive than the West Bank. I mean, um, he, uh, Human Rights Watch uh, uh, lists uh, Western Sahara um, along with um, Sudan, North Korea, uh, Tibet, and Uzbekistan as like the worst of the worst in terms of the the the, 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 the totality of the the repression um, and. Um, and, and so it has not been as well organized, but there, there's indeed a comparable movement. Indeed, it's a fairly big deal in Europe right now. A campaign in Norway, for example, you know, convinced that country's vast pension fund to divest uh, from a, uh, its, its, its investment in a, um, a, a mining company, which was uh, illegally exploiting the, the phosphates uh, in, in that country. Uh, so there is some, some work on, on that. Um, just in terms of the targeting uh, companies, you mentioned Hewlett Packard and everything. I think I, I think it's great. I, I, I support uh, support the, the such boycotts and things like that. But part of the problem is we, we use the analogy with, with uh, a lot of people use the analogy with South Africa and the, the divestment campaign there. And I was very active in that myself as both an undergraduate in the late '70s and a graduate student in the '80s. Um, but you know, in, in, in the case of um, of, of uh, South Africa. A direct foreign investment was the number one way that the United States was backing uh, South Africa. It's pretty far down the list <laughs> when it comes to uh, uh, to Israel, and and, it, and I mean, if we got all these companies to, to pull out, um, you know, should probably increase the aid by that 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 amount. In fact, already there have been, um, I think, uh, at least 16 or 18 states. I believe Pennsylvania might be one of them that has actually passed a law. That um, any company uh, is the, 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 that 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 the, the state will not have any contracts with any uh, uh, company, nor and they will divest or not invest the state pension funds in any company that boycotts Israel. But if you look at the the bill, it defines Israel as Israel or territories controlled by Israel. So the fact is, there's not a single U.S. company that is currently by, uh, boycotting Israel. This legislation is designed to punish socially conscious companies that will not, that do not support the occupation and settlements. So, in other words, we, you know, that that, you know, there are those with a lot more that that the pressure that there's, there's a lot more powerful pressure to to invest and to support the settlements and the occupation than there and then what than what we can organize to. To to to, uh, to to prevent it, and that the backlash has been so overwhelmingly against BDS, and in certain ways it is, has created a disincentive for HP and others to because if they did do what we want them to do, think of all the office equipment they could no longer sell to state governments. <laughs> I mean, it would be a disaster for them. No way they're going to, you know, do it no matter how much we, we boycott. Um, so uh, again, I, I think that underscores that. that, that, that again, I, I, I support the HP boycott anyway, obviously, and it is a strong moral thing. And there's something I ought to say, even if you're never successful. Like Cornell University never divested from South Africa, but by God, we got everybody talking about South Africa and understanding South Africa. So a lot of these, so so in many of these campaigns, the goal may not, the realistic goal may not be divestment per se, but the the education that comes along with it. So I'm not again, I'm not saying it, 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 that that it's a waste of time. 
but I think it, it's an illustration of the political climate that perhaps we need to, to put, put more energy into trying to um, you know, pressure uh, our, our, our state and, 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 and federal uh, governments to educate people on, on, on this issue. Uh, and to, uh, to and try to prevent the kind of legislation that has passed, uh, you know, so many legislatures, and it's currently before uh, quite a few others uh, that is going to, um, you know, uh, you know, make it, uh, um, you know, financially uh, uh, um, irrational for any country uh, to to pull out of the uh, uh, West Bank. Stephen, a, a few times you referred to Israel as the world's only Jewish state. Mm -hmm. um, so you're obviously comfortable referring to Israel as a Jewish state. So I want to ask this as broadly as possible because that is a, you know, there's a lot of discussion about that or controversy. So mm -hmm. what does that mean for you to refer to Israel as a Jewish state? Um, it's the only state in the world that is predominantly Jewish. And that is how Israel identifies itself. I strongly object to the, the position that the United States has taken, um, and this is a recent addition to the many demands that the Palestinians recognize Israel as a Jewish state. Um, it's an, one of many examples I've cited of the U.S. moving the goalposts when other Palestinian Authority or Fatah the PLO agree to something, they add new demands. Well, you know, after the, the, you know, the, the, the Palestinians agreed to every single uh, 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 compromise like crazy, to essentially agree with a, a draft outline peace proposal that Secretary of State Don Kerry had put forward. Uh, Israel, meanwhile, rejected virtually all of it. But the United States added, the you know, administration added the requirement that Israel, that the, that the, the uh, Palestinian Authority recognize Israel as a Jewish state. And, and for obvious political reasons, including the fact that 20% of the Israeli population are Palestinians, uh, they could not do that. Abbas said, look, Israel can call itself whatever it wants, but <laughs> don't demand that, that of us. But because he couldn't accept that, John Kerry could say, oh, both sides refused to compromise. And I mean, that was the, the recognizing Israel as a Jewish state. That was not required of Egypt in their peace treaty. It was not required of Jordan in their peace treaty. This is a new addition. In fact, I don't know of any peace agreement in history where one side was required to formally recognize the ethnic or religious identity of the other. Um, so uh, I, and, and, and again, this is uh, another example of how I believe the United States is not really interested in peace, but Pax Americana. Um, that, that, uh, but um, again, I, I, so, so by referring to Israel as a Jewish state, I am not, um, I, I'm not taking the position that we, we, we should formally recognize it as such, but just that again, the majority of the Israeli population is Jewish and that's how they identify themselves. Um, mine was question was sort of very closely related to that um, for me um, and at least um, for as long as I've understood it um, Israel being a Jewish state was referring to the, the legal system and bureaucratic system um, of, of legal and institutionalized discrimination and de facto apartheid mm -hmm. the policies regarding such things as land um, for example, in the ownership of land by the Jewish National Fund for exclusive use of Jewish people, um, restriction of permits um, into and outside of Israel or to construct homes or um, attending schools in terms of funding. Yeah, there, yeah, there are literally over 50 laws yeah. that um, this, in, uh, in, in Israel that uh, discriminate against uh, um, Palestinian citizens yeah. of Israel. It's not quite, I think apartheid is a little too strong, uh, at least at this point, <laughs> to describe it. Uh, unlike the West Bank, where it really is pretty close to apartheid, but it's no, no question there is some you know, serious institutional discrimination. Yeah. Um, I was just um, wondering what your thoughts on um, the statement that really, um, given the historical sort of erasure of 1948 Palestinians, mm -hmm. the Palestinian citizens of Israel, sort of erasure of their identity um, and the erasure of the existence of the Palestinian diaspora, in mm -hmm. particular the actual event of the Nakba, yeah. um, that, um, that at this point in time, I mean, even J Street is against the occupation. So it, yeah. it's at this point in time, it's, more, it's necessary to 
go beyond just into yeah. occupation um, and you know, you know, I, 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 you know for, for over 40 years I, I advocated a two-state solution as the the, the um, even though I believe that you know morally and legally the Palestinians had a right to return as a result uh, of the Nakba and and even though I was un, you know un, uncomfortable with um, um, a uh, you know the the uh, the um, um, you know the idea of you know of, a, of an you know an, an ethnically or religiously identified state in terms of what it meant to the people who are not of that of that background um, that uh, you know a, a establishment of a viable Palestinian state on the West Bank and Gaza Strip with shared Jerusalem you know you know seemed like the, the most realistic and, and indeed the Palestinian Authority Fatah PLO uh, accepted that but. Um, and and as, as I mentioned when I at, when I was here last year, I was still you know um, part of the uh, dwindling number of people who still held out hope that a two-state solution was possible. But I think uh, combined with um, my, my most re recent trip this past summer, which was my first in 10 to 12 years, and I saw the with my own eyes how the uh, settlements had expanded to a point where they surround virtually every. Um, a Palestinian population center. The fact that um, you know we we have a, um, a, a our the current the new administration uh, is is, a, is opposed to uh, any kind of Palestinian statehood, and that the the Democrats uh, are, support uh, Palestinian statehood only on Israeli terms, which would you know be a Bantustan type kind of situation. I at this point. I, I, I have reluctantly, uh, but uh, soberly, uh, but uh, increasingly clearly come to the conclusion that we need to start talking about a binational state, um, and and that that that, uh, that it is too, indeed too late uh, for a two-state solution. And and for those of you who've known my work on this these past 40 years, that's a big step for me <laughs> to uh, to come to uh, to that 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 conclusion. Uh, I, I do support the idea of a binational state, though, as opposed to just a one person, one vote, you know, a democratic secular state, just because I believe that one, you know, given Jewish history as, as minorities, you know, that the idea, and, uh, uh, it's, it's important to have, uh, you, know, uh, you know, certain guarantees that would not, you know, uh, necessarily happen without that. The fact that whether or not one believes Zionism is, is legitimate or that uh, the state of Israel is legitimate, the fact is that Zionist Jews have lived in the area for 125 years at this point and a distinct national identity has emerged, um, just as a distinct Palestinian identity, you know, has emerged uh, during that, uh, that same, um, you know, period. And so, you know, so, so acknowledgement of that, uh, you know, through a binational framework. And I mean, there are a number of proposals, everything from a bicameral legislature, you know, where, you know, you know one is uh, selected uh, based on ethnicity and one is more general and you have to have a two-thirds majority or you know, get it something through. I mean, there are various formulas or a cantonal system or a, or a confederation. I mean, there are a number of, um, of, of, of proposals out there. But the fundamental thing is that you need to guarantee, absolutely guarantee minority rights, whoever that minority may end up being. And uh, it has to be based on the principle of equality. And uh, I, I think uh, that those are the, um, um, that, 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 that I believe is, is the bottom line. There's two things. Yeah. Okay, one and then two. I'm, I'm just sitting here uh, struggling with the same, th the same thing needs to happen that has always needed to happen when we're trying to make this country better or behave better and be a better <laughs> place in the world. Uh, I mean, if you believe in peace rather than war and, and so on. And as we continue to find ourselves cycling back to the same problems in, interiorly, just trying to think of how we get at making the point in some global context that, that allows the centers of power here to be moved to do something different <laughs> for a change. Mm -hmm. I mean, I always give myself hope because this country is always so aspirational in terms of, of virtues, but that's not how we live. Mm -hmm. And so how are we going to make this have have a kind of urgent visibility that 
had it, the moments of the civil rights movement had at times, moments against the war in Vietnam had at times, a kind of implacable, un, irresistible, ultimately, uh, mm -hmm. push for the right thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, knowing full well, nevertheless, that the nation has the ultimate power of co-opting anything and has always <laughs> done it that way. I, I, um, I gave a recent uh, talk at the University of North Carolina in, in Chapel Hill, and I went by the, uh, the Wilson Library, uh, and they had a little display about the history of the university. It's the um, oldest state university in the country. And, um, and for the 19, and they had, it had info displays in various, you know, throughout the history. For the 1960s, they showed a, 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 a picture from Moratorium Day, 1969. Uh, and uh, in, in, in front and center of the picture was a 12-year-old boy with shaggy hair and a paisley shirt holding up a sign that said, U.S., get out of Vietnam, stay out of the Middle East. And I recognized that kid was me. <laughs> Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, Carolina Friends School had let out that day so we could all go down and take part in the demonstration. And that was the sign that I made. Um, and I could, even back then, <laughs> I knew, had a bad feeling <laughs> about, uh, about the U.S. policy uh, in, that, uh, in that part of the world. Uh, so again, this is, this is a, long, a long struggle. Um, I mean, I, 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 I think I, what... One thing I think is important to emphasize is, I, is that um, um, I, I think it's important to, to though, get, well, recognize the unique aspects of this relationship, uh, of this situation that I described, that we also um, not, not fall into a kind of Middle East exceptionalism. It really is a lot of the same, uh, I mean, that... that um, our, 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 our policy uh, in, in the middle, I mean, I, I, for example, I argue that it's not simply a matter of the pro-Israel lobby because, you know, we supported Morocco's, we support Morocco's occupation of, of uh, Western Sahara, we support Indonesia's occupation of East Timor, we didn't need an ethnic Moroccan American or Indonesian American lobby to force us to do so. I mean, there's so, uh, the kind of, uh, that, 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 that we're struggling with the same areas of military industrial complex. I mean, the aid to Israel, you know, talk about, you know, we have like three and a half billion dollars of aid to Israel, far more than any other country, Another tiny percentage, what a ripoff. 80% 80, 80 of all U.S. aid to Israel goes to American arms manufacturers. And, and, and that, and, and according, I talked to the head, the head procurement officer for the idea, Israeli Defense Forces, and he said, the stuff that they give us is not stuff we've asked for or, or, or need. It's to keep the assembly lines of McDonnell Douglas and Lockheed Martin running. And for every dollar of U.S. military aid, the Israelis have to spend two or three dollars on training personnel and spare parts. Um, and and the, the um, and we have and and and, uh, uh, and it, but again the, the the line is that you know somehow this is um, you know that the, all the lobby is making, is wasting our tax you know payer money again this is something we do ourselves I, I in fact I remember I talked to at least a half dozen Arab foreign ministers deputy foreign ministers and I've asked them why are you still so friendly with the United States given what we're doing to the Palestinians and every one of them has answered along the lines of Oh, your State Department guy or your, uh, your your ambassador explained to us that the Jews really control U.S. foreign policy and you can't help it. You know, uh, whoever heard that one before. You know, it's not us. It's that rich cabal Jews behind the scenes that are making us to do it. And and the and and uh, and, and what, what I hear implied in, in your in your question is that when you compare to other struggles. Um, the, 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 the successful, all the other successful struggles, while obviously you know, centered on the particular issue at hand, put it in the context of broader shared values, of justice, of peace, of enlightened self-interest, you know, and, um, and, 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 and did it in ways that could broaden the movement uh, and instead of, instead of uh, divide people. Uh, and you know, and the, the, the good news is that we're seeing a shift a big shift in terms of public opinion, and it's, it's getting, uh, and, and, uh, and especially with younger people. Indeed, uh, I have, in, in polling data I've looked at, with the exception of GLBTQ issues, there is no political issue that parallels age as precisely as Israel-Palestine. Older people tend to take the more you know, traditional, rigid, pro-Israeli government kind of perspective. The younger you are, the uh, more likely you are able, you're either pro-Palestinian or take a more balanced 
perspective. And this is particularly true in the Jewish community. Uh, the majority of American Jews over 30, under, thir under 30, are either non-Zionist or if they do identify as Zionist, they're in the peace camp. And I mean, it's an open joke among my Jewish students. They dread coming home for Thanksgiving uh, or, or Passover because they know they're going to get a fight with their parents or Uncle Mario over, the, over Israel, you know. Um, <laughs> and it, it, it's um, that, that, uh, that and, and, and it's also paralleling uh, um, a political party and ideology. I think we're getting rid of that, 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 that older sentimental, the, 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 the generation of older liberals, you know, who, who you know, from the post-war generation who carried a lot of the guilt around the Holocaust, who remember Israel pre-67 when it was a lot more vulnerable and its democratic institutions were strongest, you know, the ones who who's, who were introduced to it by Paul Newman and Exodus, you know, and that really idealistic, you know, almost cowboy and Indian kind of, you know, uh, uh, view of the conflict. You know, that, that, that generation is still pretty powerful in, in positions of power in Washington and elsewhere, but in terms of the overall population, declining. Um, so I, I, I think, so, so, so I, I, we're, we're seeing, and, and the, I mean, look at the Bernie Sanders campaign. That was amazing. Here was, here was a, a, the, the, there's no candidate Who's, who's done anywhere nearly as well as Bernie Sanders are, who is willing to challenge the orthodoxy on Israel-Palestine. And it was a Jewish guy, you know. <laughs> that, 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 it, 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 that, I mean, I think that was huge. And it, and it, it helped him. I mean, that, that was, that, that, I mean, polls show that more people agreed with him than Hillary Clinton, who's traditionally very hawkish, big supporter of, of, of the Israeli government. And, and so... Um, you know, I, 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 and and and, but and yes, the democratic part, the, the democratic platform on on uh, on Israel and Palestine was awful, uh, but it, um, but they had to fight to keep it keep it that way. <laughs> there was a big fight, if you may recall, with Cornell West and others. You know, you know, challenging it. Um, there didn't used to even be a fight. It was just kind of a given. And so, you know, I think we really are, you know, seeing a shift. Um, when, when, it, when, when does that takeoff moment going to be? Um, I don't know, but it, it's coming. And I, I really see, see, the, see the early signs. And so I, I'm actually um, you know, optimistic that, uh, that, uh, that U.S. public opinion is changing. Um, and in fact, in fact uh, uh, indeed, on, on a whole number of issues, range, I mean, major, you know, the majorities believe we should have put sanctions in Israel over the settlements that only 15% agree with the U.S. policy of vetoing or blocking the U.N. from recognizing Palestine as an independent state. I mean, there's hardly any issue where the um, elected officials are more out of sync with, the, with their constituents, especially Democrats, than this issue. But remember, this is what it was like about Vietnam, too, wasn't it? And about the nuclear freeze and about sanctions in South Africa. Yeah. And, 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 and who had even heard of East Timor? Um, <laughs> but, um, the, the, that, but, but gradually, you know, that, 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 that we, we, we forced, uh, we pressed the issue and it grew and, it, and, and, and eventually we won um, on, on, on these issues. So uh, I'm actually fairly optimistic in the longer term to be, but again, how many people are gonna have to suffer in the meantime? And uh, that, yeah, that's, you know, and that, that's the question. There and then, then Steve. I'm afraid we're going to have to um, make Steve our last question in that case. Okay. <laughs> um, two things. I just want to affirm what you just said about, quote, we won. What won in those instances was justice. So what won was justice. I want to go back briefly. Um, well, and again, I also agree that the tide is, I, I'd like to think also that the tide is turning. I want to go back um, to the matter of one state, two state, and some of the comments you made on that. Um, something that I've heard the current general secretary of AFSC say, say several times about whether AFSC supports a one state or two state solution is we don't support either, that it's up to Israel and Palestine to negotiate that. And I'm just wondering whether you feel there's a distinction as a scholar, as people who are informed on these things, we can speculate that, oh, it's looking like we've lost our chance for this mm -hmm. or our opportunity for that. But as friends, doesn't it seem important that what we would support is the statement that was made. Mm -hmm. 
that what we support is that those who are central to it are the ones who need to make the decision. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> I, I very much agree with that. And um, I, was, I was just sharing my personal opinion uh, about uh, you know, what I, how my, my view has evolved, not because of a ideological shift, but on, on my assessment as a political scientist as, uh, as to what is um, it's realistic. Um, but I, I, I think it, it does probably, probably make sense to, to um, um, I mean, I, I, I fully uh, support uh, uh, putting it in, the, in those, ter those terms, both because of the principle involved. I mean, it is certainly morally right. Um, but um, it, I think, tactically, <laughs> it's uh, um, uh, strategically, I, I think it it it, uh, it 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 puts us in a stronger position and 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 out of unnecessary uh, debates. Um, we can, I think, you know that that, that I think you know, again the fundamental thing is is uh, the security and rights for both peoples, uh, for Israelis and Palestinians, and whether it be done as separate states of Israel and Palestine or by national state or whatever. Again, I would agree that it it. it, it um, is up to what whatever can be uh, be worked out uh, among 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 them, but that um, that, that principle of justice and equality uh, and, and and safety um, is fundamental. Now, it's also I think also realistically, um, I mean, there's a longtime Israeli peace activist named Ori Abneri who is still holding out for a two-state solution. I mean, he he are and he is one of the first Israelis to advocate that actually way back when, and. Um, he said, you know, said, hey, this is, it's, it's, you know, working for a two-state solution is, is, is like um, trying to swim across the English Channel. You're halfway across, you're exhausted, they think there's no way you're going to make it, and so you decide to swim to America. Um, that being the one-state solution. You know, in other words, the, the idea that if Israel's not going to accept 20, you know, uh, freedom of 22% of Palestine, you know, if they're not going to give up 22% of Palestine, how are they going to give up 100%? But in, in certain ways, you know, their policies have led to this situation where, where um, um, we are going to have to start looking at a solution that uh, involves the entire geographic area of the former British mandate between the Jordan River uh, and the um, uh, and Mediterranean that, and that, uh, that it will probably, uh, as with apartheid South Africa, uh, require certain, uh, certain uh, pressure, economic and other pressures to uh, to, 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 to make that happen. Uh, but, you know, just as there were, you know, um, you know uh, pragmatists like uh, F.W. Clerk, who you know, didn't have a great moral shift, but <laughs> recognized uh, that on utilitarian terms he, he had to deal, um, the, that, uh, that uh, I, I, I think that there will be uh, eventually uh, Israelis who, whatever their ideological uh, preferences uh, may be, um, will will recognize uh, that uh, the, the the future uh, requires uh, e, uh, justice and equality uh, for for the, the the Palestinians as well, and, and again, that's where we need to uh, we need to head. But I, th I really appreciate you uh, uh, for reminding us of that position by the AFSC, which I and I indeed indeed support. Steve, our last question. I hate to disappoint you. I think this is more of a comment, but 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 res responding. Um, I was thinking of Maurice's question, and I think it's a really good one. And I appreciated your nuanced and 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 response, talking about a lot of different things in trends. I also remember early on in your talk, you're talking from the heart about your ambivalence mm -hmm. about the BDS campaign. Mm -hmm. But I think I would want to underline for people who are thinking seriously about Maurice's question, take the time to learn about what is in the call, what other groups around the world are, are doing, because the kinds of changes that you're talking about are not only going to come from electoral movements, they're not only going to come mm -hmm. from lobbying and shifting a long-standing pattern of U.S. imperialism that has generated mm -hmm. the current, you know, or, or created the context for the current situation, is like in many struggles, it's going to be people 
doing local campaigns around this and that and applying pressure in more and more civil societies and organizations, shifting the, the pattern that you're already talking about and seeing. And so I just would really want to seriously con uh, urge people to think about the strategic possibilities of the ways that our congregations, our workplaces, our citizens groups could do if they learned about and actively started picking what part of the BDS campaign worldwide that they could put their shoulder to the wheel to. And I think that increases the chances of the things you were talking about. Thank you, Steve. And let me also just plug um, uh, that there will be a soon to be published uh, Pendle Hill uh, a pamphlet by Steve Chase. Uh, uh, in which he uh, looks at both his evolution from a, uh, a Christian Zionist to an advocate of, uh, of BDS. I got to see a, a sneak advanced copy of it, and I'm, it's really powerful. And so um, be, be sure to get a copy as soon as it's uh, published. Um, so again, I want to thank you all very much for coming out. I know this is a tricky one. I, I, I know that there are at least some things that some of you disagree with me on, but I think those have, uh, that I, I still hope that it has moved your thinking forward. Um, also, if, if you're interested, I will um, leave, a, 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 I don't know where the practical place is. I have, I have an email list where I send out about once a month some of my online articles. They're usually like, you know, 1,200 words or so about uh, that. Uh, about half of them are in Israel, Palestine. Most of the others are in other aspects of U.S. Uh, foreign policy and sometimes uh, other other topics. Uh, but they're 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 not particularly academic. They're pretty read readable. Uh, again, policy briefs and and uh, and uh, you know, I do an occasional column for the National Catholic Reporter and Progressive Magazine and those kinds of things. Uh, so if um, any of you are uh, uh, if, if we could um, um, if if uh, someone could put uh, um, uh, I'll put these on a table, or yeah, but, uh, just just a uh, uh, but you know, zoom this email list or something, right. and um, and people can sign as they as as they leave. Thanks. One more round, please, for Stephen. Thank you very much. <laughs>